Oh. Hey. Hi, how's it going? What's yeah. up, Natalie? How you doing? Hello. I'm good. You are nothing Hi, if everyone. not punctual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, punctual. Audio's working. Usually, we're after. You're <laughs> muted. You're muted. <laughs> now I'm Aaron. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. Um, and I'm Mel, one one third of our hosts. <laughs> and then we've got one more. And then I'm the final third. I'm oh. Apple. Thank you for joining us today, Natalie. This this completes our we keep saying the tour of the tab horn section. <laughs> this is amazing to have you to complete this. <laughs> I uh awesome. Yeah, well, thanks for getting me. I was wondering, where are you, Natalie? I'm in Chicago right now um, in my hotel room. I'm playing with Phil and friends tonight um, and tomorrow night. So Yay. That, that is, that's so cool. <laughs> and you, that's part of the reason I wanted to talk to you. We're um, we're going to be at Skull and Roses. Oh, great. Yeah. And playing with Phil and friends, I mean, He's such a huge musical force. And and I wonder, like, for you, you're used to playing with people that are that have that big of energy and history and all that behind them. How how is that experience for you playing with him? Well, it's kind of like learning a new language, honestly, because with you know, a few exceptions, the Grateful Dead catalog hasn't had a lot of horns in the mix. And so it kind of feels like the first few shows, I was like busting the door wide open into a universe that I hadn't explored before. Um, but yeah, no, I'm definitely, I get to stand right next to him <laughs> on stage. I feel like I'm soaking up, you know, some crazy history every time. And it's been really cool to kind of learn you know, on the fly, learn on the job with this, you know, deep catalog of music that means so much to so many people. Um, yeah. And it's it's kind of like a similar feeling to when I joined Trey's band when I was a lot younger of obviously this, you know, is a whole tradition that, you know, I didn't grow up with, but so many of these people did. And how do I play true to the style? How do I do my homework and come up prepared? so that I can breathe new life into it, but with some kind of reference point to where this is all coming from. And I think Phil is really generous with his time and you know, giving us moments to, to shine throughout the night and, and lead certain numbers. And um, he's just a gem of a human being. And it's, you know, it's a really nice feeling joining you know, such a you know, well-reputed you know, crew of people. Um, yeah. But it feels like family it feels like you know very inviting right away and i think that's can be can be rare and it's definitely unique and a blessing to have discovered that in for this sure. case how do you prepare for something like that for getting that phone call and like putting your like you said respect your spin also being you know like true to the music where do you start well i think the thing that that kind of uh, connects us all is that we're all improvisers, whether we grew up studying jazz or or studying the Grateful Dead, that's the, the common thread that connects us all. And so as much as it's important to, you know, learn the songs ahead of time, sometimes they're sending the song lists out, you know, this time I think it was less than 48 hours before the first gig. So if it's a song I've never heard before, it's like, I'm going to have a limited amount of time to internalize it, but I don't really have a heart attack because I know that really this is, it's a jumping off point for improvisation. And so to trust my own musical intuition and my grounding and having really big ears on stage and reacting to what's happening, I know that I'm not going to um, totally step in it most likely, you know? So <laughs> I think that's the thing that, that helps me prepare for it. It's just the years and years of being in the moment and reacting and responding to people on stage. It's really different than say growing up playing in an orchestra or even like a rock band where there's not such an emphasis on improvisation. You're just a horn section playing the same horn lines every night. Like luckily Jen James and I have like a really shorthand method of communication where we can make stuff up on the fly. Like 
in a heartbeat and the next measure already be playing it in three part harmony. So we've developed that over the years. And even if it's a unfamiliar song or unfamiliar territory, we have that to, um, to kind of fall back on and, and it tends to work out all right. You, you know, you, I want to go back to something that you said too, like with fish tab, the grateful dead, there's this musical universe that encapsulates the music, right? There's, there's history, there's inside jokes, there's, like different language there's it's a whole thing like each one yeah, of them it's, it's more than music it's yeah it's a and it that is a trip to me as a fan being part of that but i always wonder from your perspective on the stage like beyond the music the culture of those things what's your take on all of that oh wow well I don't know. I mean, I'm just kind of in awe of it. And I think that it's it. I think what's great about it is that it just paints this. It's so much more than the music, the music, it transcends the music. It's it's just a, a snapshot of just the human experience, because right. so much about coming to hear these same songs years after years is that it transports you to a time and place, a different time and place, and maybe your youth or maybe the friends you met along the way. And, you know, that's something that I don't necessarily always feel playing on a jazz gig like there is some interaction with the audience, but it's not like, oh, this is a whole culture and I'm just, you know, yeah. dipping a, a, you know, my foot in it for the first time. So if there is something that's like really fulfilling about seeing the joy on people's faces and seeing how much weight there is to what we're doing, that's really different than anything I've done before. So I, you know, in a way it's cool. I mean, part of me is like, oh, well, I could have grown up that way. And then I could have been experiencing this from the beginning. But at the same time, it's cool now to have this appreciation and just be, you know, you know, it's, you know, we've been playing and touring a long time to be stunned and surprised by something on stage is kind of rare. And it's, it's cool to have those moments where I'm like, wow, everyone knows the lyrics better yeah. than I do. Like they, <laughs> they've lived and breathed this their whole life. That's it's so really cool. cool. And, you know, the people along the way are so generous and open. I think it's just, I don't know, the times, types of people that show up to this kind of music tend to be really good people. So I've made some friends along the way. Um, and that's always a beautiful thing too. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's such a big thing. And, and I know that like from, from the stage, you can't focus on that because that hinders what you're doing. You just kind of have to let it go and just do your thing and trust that everything is the way it should be. But like when we talked to Jen, I, I had mentioned, um, you know, the Beacon Jams and the time that you all did that, it was such a medicinal thing for all of us. We were hurting, you know, as a community, it was hard. And to have that come out was such a, a balm for like our spirit and to make us feel connected to something that we had been missing for so long and to see you guys doing it again. It just, the whole thing was, it was a huge deal. And, and I wonder, I mean, I know how, what Jen said, but I, I, what's your take on that? Like, do you feel that coming back at you, even though there's nobody in the room uh -huh. and there, you're just looking at comments on a screen? Yeah, um, well, I think in the moment, it was actually really hard to feel it. I mean, I did two weekends of it. So I guess by the second weekend, I had the days in between of like seeing on the internet people and the comments helped for sure. It wasn't it didn't feel like we were just playing to a wall, but um, but it wasn't the same as a concert. However, even without a live audience and without that interplay that we're so used to in the scene, um, I would think from my perspective, I was it was a balm for me to be playing music again, you know, not on my living room couch and just being able to do what I do again after months and months of not being able to do it at all. It, for me, it was healing as well. Um, and then, it, you know, just the charitable aspect of it. And then, yeah, just getting the videos of kids, you know, banging on pots and pans and, uh, you know, how, how it be, became like a family, um, you know, sit around the, the TV and, and, you know, join in on this together. It was a really heartwarming and important thing that helped us get by. Um, and so I, but I think in the moment it, you don't necessarily feel that 
when you're you're playing with your back to where the audience normally is to like a brick wall basically so and weird. you get the comments from time to time <laughs> yeah like the stage setup was all t all backwards so it didn't yeah it was like it was really weird because they do this countdown you know and we're just on stage at least for the first week we were just on stage and there felt no there, i didn't feel like there was any difference between like a 10 count and when we were live like we were still just in the same space that we've been all week rehearsing and all of a sudden there's uh, thousands tens of thousands of people listening um it was kind of surreal and didn't really sink in that everyone was there until kind of after the fact and it seems like too that for tab those moments of like uh I don't even know what you would call them. Just those moments seem to be happening often lately, you know, like with the whole taboos run and the ovation that James got and all of that. Like, I can't even imagine what that feels like to have that wave of whatever coming at you standing on the stage. And I, I'm, we really loved the taboo shows how was that for you Nat? it was cool because there was just this i mean tab shows are always different every night anyway it's just because there is that a lot of moments to improvise and collaborate but having this kind of premise of like okay at some point they're going to come up and what are we going to do this time that's going to top what we did last time it created a lot of nice dynamics to the tour and it wasn't like we were showing up to do the same show every night it was always like long sound checks, you know, working on the material, making sure it was all going to work. And I love that because, you know, it's really rare to be in the same band for 13 years and still be trying to like, you know, push things a little further forward and, and make things that much better, you know, create these little, you know, Easter eggs for the audience like that is really unique to just a few bands, I think. And, and I think Trey is one of the prime examples of how much he cares and how much he works around the clock to to surprise and thrill his audience and having the you know the goose um, collaborations was definitely in line with that and so it was kind of fun to wake up and you know either get an email or a text or something with like okay how about this and like same with the billy strings thing you know that was a fun curveball as well and you know I think it's so rare to be in a horn section and, and get to, you know, be in a position where you're growing and learning and stretching the boundaries of what you can do after many, many years of being in the same lineup, basically. Um, you know, I think that's pretty unique. Can I ask you a silly question? <laughs> it's gonna, this is going to be off the wall, but whatever. I don't care. Um, you know, when on the last night of the taboo shows, like you guys all did the conga line thing and Trey had the plastic torch mm -hmm. and that whole thing. And the whole, like passing the torch, whatever that's going on online, when people see all that, I, I what do you think about all that? Like, is that, is that a thing is, I mean, do you think that's conscious or, or is that just like, we like these guys, so we're going to have them play with us. What, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think Trey's like, I'm not dead yet. You know, like that right. body python thing, like he's still in his prime, right? So I don't think he's trying to pass any torches. But uh, that being said, there's room for everyone to do their thing. Um, yeah, like I just think Trey's like not not retiring anytime soon. So I don't think the torch is being passed, but it's more like, let me let me like support these other guys that are doing cool things and you know, try and impart my his decades and decades of wisdom and help these young guys, you know, um, th I think it's all very inclusive, like there's room for several torches to be passed or no torches to be passed at all, right? <laughs> just lighting up the stage it, at it, this point. Yeah, it's less, it's less passing the torch and me using my torch to light your campfire. <laughs> I think that's exactly that I like yeah. that so much better. Yeah. So Natalie, can we talk about your beginnings in music? Because that is super interesting to me because you've had such a you said you've been with tap for 13 years. That's a huge chunk of your career. Like, how did that even, you know, enter into your life and, and your your beginnings with the love of music, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I've always 
music has been a really big part of my life since the very beginning because my parents are musicians and it was always a more than like a career it was like a community so I think that luckily stayed the case when I joined tab um so I th I don't know I think the the kind of music that my parents played was already kind of unique and very expansive like they um specialized in Latin jazz and Brazilian music oh wow as well as jazz and you know all sorts of styles they say they played with a a world music ensemble um, doing music in Hindu. Like it was always just a wide open um, spectrum of things that I got exposed to as a kid. And some of my first gigs were sitting in with them or tagging along to gigs and singing a little bit or playing a little bit. So I didn't come up in the same world that I'm in now, but I came up with a similar aesthetic of like, you know, there's so much great music and really the only two types of music there are is like good music and bad music and even that's kind of subjective at that point yeah. mm -hmm. but um so i you know i was a pretty and i i didn't really start specializing in one direction until i had to decide to study in college and i wanted to study music and so i went to a jazz conservatory and that was the only time where i was like kind of saying i'm going to choose this genre and really focus on that however that same year that I moved to New York to go to college, Trey called me and I got started with TAB. So in between classes and finals, I was rehearsing and touring. And um, thank God, honestly, because I think that it kept me true to my original ethos, which was try and learn a lot from all directions. And you know, don't, don't try and act like one kind of music is supreme or better than anything else. So I think it kind of saved me from from um, losing sight of all the other great music that I had grown up with. What is it with um, him taking people out of school? <laughs> I know, well, I graduated, I stayed with it. It was luckily like, Tab has always been something that it's like a few short tours a year and I was able to get like an artistic leave of, of, of absence and did my finals and did everything from the road, so. That's so cool. I, I have to ask too, like, what drew you to the trombone? Well, my dad made it look pretty cool. He's an amazing trombone <laughs> player. Cool. I grew up like tagging along the, you know, his gigs and didn't seem like a nerdy band instrument to me. <laughs> you know, he was rocking out with these salsa bands. And then when I was nine, he started playing and touring with Santana. Oh, um, so okay. it was like, oh, I want to do that. Like, that sounds like a lot of fun to go around the world and play trombone. Um, and my mom's a singer, so I kind of just ended up following in the family business, more or less. <laughs> There's a few videos out there that I found of you playing with your dad and the smiles on both of your faces is just amazing to see you playing <laughs> with him. Yeah, well, we don't get to do it every day. And so it's always really special when, when it happens. And we actually, when I'm not on the road, we play together every week. We have this like uh, trombone Aww. quartet. Thing in, in San Francisco, and we meet up and play quartets with two other guys. So we, we get to do it a little bit more than when I lived on the East Coast, but it is still really special when it happens. I was I was going to switch gears here for a second too. First of all, we all want to congratulate yeah. you. And congratulations! Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, look at that <laughs> smile, man! Yeah. Well, <laughs> it is, it's kind of magical because you two have been creating music for a while now and like watching the videos and listening to the music like your courtship kind of played out in front of everybody and the music you make together is just beautiful i mean i don't know portuguese but even just hearing the way you sing your voice and everything i'm just wondering if you could talk a little about your your collaboration and where it's taking you now yeah, no, um, no, I'm really, really thankful to have found Ian as a collaborator and, and partner in crime in life because yeah we've just I think we bring out the best in each other musically and creatively and um, it's uh, just limitless inspiration working with him um, and crafting the songs together and, and making the, the music and playing shows together also it's just mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a, a better way to spend my time so um, but yeah so we've 
speaking of being in the family, he's like recording with my mom and dad right now as we speak. Oh, on her wow. album. And, yeah. So he's always been kind of a family friend, actually started working with him through my mom, you know, several years ago, but, um, and then she took me to this Brazil, Brazilian music camp that he teaches at, and I was his guitar student. <laughs> and uh, we oh, okay. started collaborating, like I'd write lyrics to some of his songs. And then, you know, it all just kind of took off from there, like from about, yeah, six or seven years ago till now. That's... And yeah, now having two albums out together, we get to tour together and play shows together. So it's just the best. I love it. Oh, well, it, like, the, think about like and cooking together. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, oh, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of cooking, too. Yeah. <laughs> Usually as a musician, you have to like leave your family behind to go tour and travel. And so having being able to make an album with not just your husband now, but like your parents, too. And like that seems like your life. So you, you never have to leave anybody behind is the point, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's really nice. I mean, and that it's weird because, you you know, obviously it's touring is a grueling kind of situation, you know, driving from city to city and just kind of, you know, not having much time other than to like sleep, eat and play. Yeah. But it's funny when I'm on tour with Ian, I can kind of trick myself into feeling like I'm on vacation because it's Aww. just like, That's you know, we're just kind of hanging out together. All the downtime becomes like quality time and we, we're big foodies. We love to eat. So it's like, where should we eat lunch? Like it's, it feels like a date, you know, it's not like, you know, the same thing as when you're touring with like, you know, six different people and you have to all come to a consensus about what you're going to spend your off time doing. So it's pretty great. Congratulations on that. That's like the, the highest form of quality of life. Because again, I know, like, right? <laughs> that's, it's just, if we could just keep it going, I'll be so happy. Yeah. Well, you're in a good trajectory. Yeah. To yeah. Going. <laughs> I don't like you said, Trey's not stopping anytime soon. And I don't see you retiring anytime soon. So, I mean, oh no. Yeah. I'm going to be doing this for a long time. Just as long as we can keep the gigs getting booked and tours getting routed, we'll, we'll be continuing on to do it. And, and yeah, we just have so much more material that we got. We have a wealth of stuff that we just have to find time to get into the studio and record so that we can keep putting out music. Wow. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say I saw her. Like your yours and Eden's relationship is it's so cute to see play out. And I heard too that he did like you mentioned being foodies. I saw like mm -hmm. when he proposed he like did the classic like the ring and the dessert at your favorite restaurant. <laughs> yep, yeah, it was pretty impressive. And like the fact that we were we were like, on vacation together for you know that whole 10 days and it was like the end of the trip and i had no idea what was coming so he really? did a really good job keeping it a surprise and, yeah wow <laughs> i mean that like mel said as far as life goals are concerned that it seems like you've nailed it like you hit the lottery yeah you get to be with <laughs> yeah. the people that Talk you love the most I, all the yeah, time you're doing happening. like you're doing the thing that you love to do people are loving mm -hmm. what you're up to and like you just said you're you get to like when we talk to musicians a lot of the time they're like oh my god the road it's so hard it's so miserable you know whatever and you're like I, i'm with my husband it can like, be like yeah so that's I, I, to me i i see that as like what you're putting out into the world coming back to you tenfold Ah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I'm, you know, having a blast. And I think it's one of the things that makes playing music so rewarding is that it's not like you have this, um, like, what's the word, Categor uh, compartmentalized work life and regular life. Like, it's all one thing. And so we actually, like, on our days off, like, choose to spend time making more music and, <laughs> and continuing and that's really, you know, really unique. And there's some, you know, the drawbacks being the road can be tough and right. traveling is exhausting. But um, in, in general, I just feel really grateful to just have a space to be doing this at all. And and loving what I do is is a blessing. So I'm always super happy about that. I, I'm curious to you. Trom trombone is one of my favorite in instruments, honestly. I, I played in seventh and eighth grade in band. <laughs> 
you know, but my I was my mom and dad, you know, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller to this day, still swing music, big band music. It's so beautiful to me. I, I look on I just wondering how it feels. You, you know, I look at you look at lists of like top trombonists. You're listed not very far behind like Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, like the great state. How does that make you feel? Um, well, sometimes I feel very unworthy of that. Like, <laughs> um, it, I don't really believe it. I don't buy into it, but it is nice to be recognized. Um, but I think, you know, maybe I'll get used to that one day, but it's just, yeah, I just kind of feel like a bit unworthy of being on that you. list, but, um, you deserve it. Yeah, I think 100%. we all have a little bit of that, but, yeah. um, but no, it's great. My heroes are, you know, on those downbeat poles and just getting to be in that category with them and represent for women too, because there aren't a yeah. lot of women on that list. I feel very empowered. Um, yeah. With with everything that happened during um, COVID and like you, you said, you know, doing Beacon Jams was, at least I'm not sitting on my couch playing my instrument I'm out doing my thing. Do you think that the time that we had where we couldn't go out and do anything, do you think that helped you? Do you think that that time helped you hone your craft? I absolutely do. And sometimes I feel, Ian and I talk about this, like we feel guilty about admitting it, but the co the COVID pandemic was actually like a really good thing for us we you know became closer as a couple closer as musical collaborators we finally had time to approach music like we did as kids like you know lit up about some song that we heard oh we have time right now to go learn it you know and it's it's a blessing and a curse to be busy you know gigging because sometimes you just get caught up and I call it like the hamster wheel of mm -hmm. just preparing for the next gig and then that gig's over and you have to learn another set of music that you might never play again and you never have time to breathe and reflect and just play whatever moves you in the moment and so mm -hmm. COVID I mean, it's a terrible pandemic but it slowed us down to being able to get back to that place of discovery and learning without an agenda and that you know I think is and you know trying to i'm trying to like preserve a piece of that because i think it's so important to like thrive and feel good as a person to give yourself that time to be creative without any kind of end goal in place so for us it was great we you know we had songs to keep us busy we were recording at my dad's studio once a week and writing in between and it it gave us you know the structure so we weren't like drowning in uh uncertainty but you know mm -hmm. We just were trying to use make the most of the time we had together and honestly like when it when things came back it was like oh i miss those days where we could just like <laughs> have a whole day to work at my dad's house like make dinner stay over nothing to do the next day you know those those that aspect was really cool and i'm glad we got to make an album that way because who knows when that'll be possible again yeah it, i i know what you mean about like you don't want to say it too loud that like it was good it was good for us like it was the same for us like we when it first started we were like oh crap we have a music pod live music podcast and there's no live music like we're done but we quickly yeah. realized that it was good like we were getting to talk to the artists and they were home and they were relaxed they weren't on the road and everybody wanted to talk so we got time with people we probably wouldn't have gotten time with and it made us and I'll bet for you too, like it made me personally take stock in why I was doing what I was doing in the first place. Like personally, yeah. do I care? Do I want to keep doing it? Does it matter? Is it doing anything for anybody else? Like all these big life questions that I wouldn't have paid attention to had I just been on the hamster wheel, like you said, all that time. Yeah. Were, were you doing that too? <laughs> like just taking stock of the whole thing and giving you a renewed appreciation for it? Yeah, I mean, I think it forced us all to dig down deep and work through some stuff that maybe hadn't seen the light of day before. Mm -hmm. um, when, yeah, when you're just in it and you're not thinking about it and you're just working, you know, it's easy not to like reflect. But I definitely had some reflections of like, 
you know, what what's really meaningful and what stuff I can let go and not worry about as much. And it was, yeah, it was also affirming because, you know, sometimes you get, um, you take for granted the, the situation of being out and playing for an audience and that energy you get back. It's so priceless. And sometimes it's just, at least before the pandemic, it was kind of like a given that, you know, you'd get that reaction, you'd have that interplay. Um, but taking that all away for like a couple of years, really, because live streams didn't have quite that same feeling and then bringing it back, you appreciate it so much more. Yeah. Um, so I'll never take that for granted again. But I also realized that I don't need to be performing to find like inner peace in my musical world, like for me, just learning and growing. And, you know, that was enough. Like, I didn't feel like I, I, I it took me a while to feel it that way because at first I was just like, oh my God, no gigs. I'm like at the the peak of like, my, you know, this time in my life is like when you're supposed to be out and getting it. And we lost, you know, two years of that, that sucks. But, and then, you know, working through that and realizing that like, I'm still growing. I think I got better as a, as a musician. I think I learned a lot as a arranger and, uh, you know, the producer on the record and, so just, you know, to kind of be able to be okay with the pause and realize that learning and growing is happening, regardless mm -hmm. of what it might look like in the moment. Can you talk to us about the the relationship between you, Jen, and James? Like, you know, because yes, yeah. it's tab, but now you've, you know, you're with Phil sometimes. And so like that, it's a very tight knit group and you t you all seem to have such a deep, profound connection. And so we've, like Aaron said, we were able to, or Apple said, we were able to talk to James, we were able to talk to Jen, but to have you on the other side to kind of complete that, you know, that little, that circle, what is it like to have that? And, and what, what is it, you know, what is it like and what is it? Yeah. Well, it's kind of like when you have a really close friend that you finish each other's sentences. We we finish each other's musical sentences. Like, yeah. not very much has to be said for us to understand what the other person is trying to communicate. And it's 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 rare. I don't have that, at least in the same strong way with anybody else. And I play with lots of other amazing horn players, but I, it's a testament to their incredible skills and our camaraderie as a trio yeah. as we call each other like tab siblings like we really i really treat i really feel like they're my older brother and sister and they've got my back Aww. on stage and off stage and and yeah there's it's just like it it's uh there's nothing quite like it just the way that we're able to play off each other and communicate with each other usually like without even having to say anything verbally like it can just be like jen sings me a line and then sings James the same line and then like four bars later we're in with like a complete horn line you know and not everyone is wired that way I think they're they have freaky good ears <laughs> you know and we're we're very quick about it and it's part of why we're starting to get hired as a section because there's this cohesion that just comes from years and years of 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 playing together but also just like being together off the stage you know um being in a, on a tour bus together it's a bond that's pretty special and <laughs> so being i think it's been a decade now that all three of us have been working together it's a long time and so we've gotten it's just yeah it's just lightning fast to the way we communicate and we have a blast and it's like no matter what the musical situation is like we you know make each other feel comfortable so that's pretty cool well that's that's what one of my favorite things too is you're all you're all you know, well known as the horn section, but beyond that, you you put the horn down and your voices. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, we do a similar thing with the vocals. Yeah, I think obviously you would answer that the way that you did, but I have to tell you that after meeting the three of you, I think it's something more. I think it's something more than ear or um, simpatico playing. I you individually the three of you are gem human beings like really good wonderful people without the music so when you take people that are like good human beings and you that have talent and you put them together something magical is going to happen you know what i mean and 
to me, that's what we as as fans are experiencing is that that love that's there coming mm-hmm. out through through the form of music, through the form of frequency and sound is coming and hitting us. And that's what we're responding to. And I think that is part of the genius of people like Trey to be able to see that and then put those pieces together. Isn't that wild? Yeah. I, yeah. He, it's crazy. I just got goosebumps by the way, with what you said, (laughs) that really hit. Um, yeah, no. And I I think, you know, I think the audience can feel that. Mm -hmm. I mean, to some degree, like the warmth and the love and the respect and, and yeah, I mean, the older I get, the more I care about playing with good human beings than like someone that's a hot shot player, but maybe isn't very nice or mm. doesn't treat you respectfully. It, it becomes so much more important at a certain level about how you feel about the person and whether you, you know, can feel that love and mutual respect. And it makes it the music making so much easier when you have that there. Mm. Um, Conversely, it makes the vibe feel very weird when it's missing. So I think Trey has always cared about that so much. And I think it's part of why he allowed an 18 year old freshman in college to join the band because there's probably other people that on paper were more qualified or more, you know, experienced in what he was asking of me, but he liked the vibe and we clicked and everyone clicked. And that, again, allows us to just elevate the music that much higher to have that feeling of 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 trust and love and and mutual respect it's so important to the creative process yeah how did he know about you at 18 years old well so the way it came down so my dad did a tour with trey like his last um tab tour before the big break um i don't know what year that was like 2005 maybe or six or yeah. um, whenever the last little run was um and so when he put the band back together in 2009 um i think it was trey or trey's manager called my dad and at the time he was still touring with santana and it'd become like pretty full time so the dates didn't work and so i think trey or patrick asked him do you have someone you recommend and my dad said well there is somebody just moved to new york and he started to list all these great skills and by the way, she happens to be 18 years old and she's my daughter. <laughs> and I think that a lot, of, a lot of people would have been like, oh, that's nice, Jeff. Yeah, nice not job. Give right? it thought. Like you're trying to get your daughter high. That's cute. But like they actually had me send them like examples of my playing. And then they try to talk to Jen and Jen was playing a really informal gig on the Upper East Side. And the audition was me just showing up and sitting in with her and we had never met before and didn't know each other and i just came in and hopped up on something and sat in and like hung out all night at the gig like getting to know her and having a blast and um she called trey that night like super late and said okay we we found the found the girl like she's it she's the one that vetted me yeah. Oh, that's even better. Yeah. Like, that's who you're literally going to be playing with. Like, of course, you're playing with Trey, but like, that's going to be your sister for however yeah. long. Like, wow. Uh, yeah. The Texan leader. And it's cool because it's like she shows you how much Trey trusts Jen to like know if it's going to work or not. Yeah. And actually, all the other newer additions to Tab have been kind of like a group suggestion like oh. jen and i had worked with james and like when that seat was open jen said you know james casey would be great so like desron also has been playing in jen's band for years we've all played in jen's band before and played with des and he was like a very logical like member of the family to bring in so it's i think that's part of why it feels different it's not like some like you know hollywood MD putting together the super band. It's like right. family for that's what I was yeah. gonna say. This what you're describing to me is a family. Yeah. That's I mean, that's yeah. how we are. You know, we all live together and and not just anybody gets into the groove. You know what I mean? You there's certain the people that you meet. Yeah, the circle of trust. <laughs> yeah, there's certain people that you meet them and you just know. You're like, oh, that that guy, we're gonna be friends forever. That's and to have that with a group of musicians is really 
kind of beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's really yeah. Cool. No, uh, it's so great. And I, I think that there's one thing to like kind of tie it all together around the band. It's like everyone's very like has a lot of sensitivity to each other and awareness. So we're, no one's like stepping out in front like in a vacuum like this is my solo or this is my moment it's always like this feeling of everyone being attuned to each other's um parts and and i think that awareness is kind of what makes it work so well Mm. and you guys have been going through some heavy stuff lately with james and yeah you can't that's not easy so i think that having that um family aspect of what you're doing is probably pivotal for him i would imagine and for you guys too to be able to support each other through this you know yeah it's like support on and off stage you know we're gonna say something Mm -hmm. about that we've seen tab seen you all several times now and i mean all bands have that connection of looking at but the way i mean that's a lot of people on stage and to see the way everybody stares at like you when you're doing a solo the support and just the looks that are going on on stage and the way everybody reads each other it is very special Mm -hmm. yeah and like i said earlier that's i think what we're picking up on yeah and i did have a question about something because obviously you know musicians and singers and everything you're disciplined and stuff but i saw somewhere that at at one point um but because of injury you were you were doing ballet yeah yeah exactly that's a different kind of i came up doing that (laughs) yeah (laughs) it was intense yeah all the way through like most of high school i was juggling that too with the music um and yeah it makes it makes all the discipline for for being a musician feel like nothing <laughs> uh, you know I mean, that's what I was wondering. Wondering. yeah I, well <laughs> I have to ask too about Portuguese mm-hmm. was that something that you already knew when you met your husband or is that something that has come out of that relationship um for the most part out of the relationship I mean my mom sing Brazilian music and speaks Portuguese. So I grew up around it, like, but I didn't learn the language until me and Ian started dating. I, I, I have always loved Brazilian music. It's been like a big passion of mine for forever. Um, but I would just learn certain songs phonet- phonetically. Like I just, you know, learn the sounds of the words and kind of look up a rough translation of what the song was about and sing it. And then as partially because Ian and I were traveling to Brazil and seeing his family and Although most of them spoke English, it's just you want to start when you yeah. love a culture and you, yeah. you know, you're spending time down there, you want to learn. It's just kind of natural. And his mom's a great Portuguese teacher. So, like, that also super helped. Um, so, that's part of it is just connecting with, with real human beings about it. Right. Making me want language. Um, but the other part was like once we started working on Ian's music and a lot of the songs are in Portuguese. It just felt like in order to really own this, I gotta, I gotta learn. Like just how I approach like learning about, you know, fish or learning about James Brown or, you know, it's like you wanna, when you, when you're called upon to do something, um, especially in the public eye, you wanna do it with a deference to the tradition and the culture that it's coming from. So I just, you know, wanted to feel authentic. And so I started studying. And funny enough, Ian hasn't been super <laughs> helpful with that part what? of the, the language learning because he's, he's a, you know, he's been in the States since he was eight. And we started, you know, our relationship, I didn't speak any Portuguese. So our language is English, you know, and now he, he only wants to talk to me in Portuguese if there's like, it happens naturally if there's one other person that's a a Brazilian in the room, then the language switches to Portuguese. But one on one, I have to work really hard, or we have to be somewhere where he's trying to tell me something that he doesn't want other people to overhear. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's when it goes to Portuguese. But otherwise, it's I can mostly credit his mom and the pandemic for how fluent I've gotten in Portuguese because we spent a lot of time with her in a little bubble, and we just spoke all Portuguese because she was that that extra person that made the language. <laughs> Portuguese is so hard. Well, that's but it's, it's awesome. very hard. 
Aaron and I, we um, we went to Fish Mexico um, a few weeks back, and prior to going, we started Duolingo to start speaking Spanish to have you know kind of like an upper hand, and and it's actually my first language. But my when my grandma passed away, my mom stopped speaking Spanish, so I I lost it, you know. So a lot of what I know. It's kind of, it's remembering, it jogs my memory, but I was like always scared to speak because I had lost a lot of my vocabulary. But once my Mm -hmm. partner and I started talking, it like opened up this whole new world of like a way to communicate in a language that is, I get, I would say foreign to both of us, because like I said, it was, you know, it kind of like left my life and I'm, I'm accepting it back. And like, to be able to have, um, well, you and Ian already have it with music, but even like another secondary language to kind of speak together and what a bond that creates, you know, like it, it, it makes it seem like you're the only two people in the world. You know what I mean? Like just speaking that language and yeah, a little bit romantic, a little bit like secretive, a little bit fun. And that's just like such a cool thing to be able to not just have the music, not just have English, but now Portuguese and, this, you know, like these multi-layered um, ways of, of loving your partner and, and having connection with your partner. And what a cool feeling that must be. Oh, yeah, it's great. And you already kind of know from everything I've said, I'm kind of like a nerd that loves to learn. So like learning this language was like another outlet for me for that. And, um, and yeah, just being able to go to Brazil and like, when I first visited, everyone was speaking to me in English. And then now Ian's friends are all like, wow, you're like fluent now. Like, I don't even have to, like, we could just talk in Portuguese. Like, it feels really good to like have, you know, to, to have people see the growth. And like, I went to this wedding of a friend of his and like, no one talked to me in English pretty much the whole time. And it was like, cool. I had like a real Brazilian wedding experience. Wow. Was really That's awesome. so cool. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite Brazilian food? Oh God, that's so hard. I well. Okay, one of your favorites. This is like, yeah, it's not important, but one of my favorites is this. Um, it's from Bahia. It's called acarajé, and it's like basically like kind of like a falafel. It's like fried black-eyed peas that are the buns, and then they fill it with like this really delicious spicy paste and dried shrimp and um, a salad of cucumbers and tomatoes and onions. And it's like out of this world. Oh, it's wow. a, it's a flavor bomb and, uh, something that I, I, there's actually a couple people that make it in the Bay area. So like maybe once a year I get some, but especially when we go to Brazil, it's like, I can't leave without having that. That's the, that's the, the there's thing. a very strong runner up, which is, yeah, there's always going to be more than one. Right. Takaka, which is this soup from the north of Brazil, from Pará. Um, and it's got the, um, the tucupi. It's like this broth with this um, kind of kelp and this this um, this herb called jambu that makes your mouth kind of numb as you're eating it. What? <laughs> it's crazy. But it's, yeah. It's like an anesthetic and they actually have a, a kind of cachaça that's infused with it. And that also is crazy because as you're drinking the cachaça, the jambu kind of numbs your mouth. Um, but that's that also comes with experience. like shrimps and <laughs> not describing it that well, but it's just like, like it tastes like the earth. It tastes like Brazil and it's like, there's nothing here that is anything like, I, I, you know, wow. that I've that's had. why I asked. We have, we so, have. Like, a- and <laughs> we, we have a friend in in we came we moved from Vegas to Portland, Oregon six years ago. Seven? Six seven. 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 And uh we have a really good family friend that's Portuguese from Brazil. And uh we would go to their house for dinner and the food was the weirdest, best stuff ever. Like and the desserts, <laughs> man. The Brazilian dessert is a uh, whole like crazy world all its own. And if if I lived in Brazil, I'd be like eight hundred pounds. Like that food is different <laughs> than anywhere on the planet. And I know you being a foodie, like that's oh, and, yeah. and you guys get into cooking all that stuff too. Like I saw that you went and like bought the special pot and like all the, you know what I mean? You get into it. Yeah. 
yeah. Oh yeah, we have one of those. Yeah, panelas, the um, the clay pots, and yeah, we make mukeka a lot. <laughs> um, Good. That stew that we demoed in the video is like classic. Um, yeah, no, it's a great. I mean, amazing food, and usually like a simple kind of amount of ingredients, like very doable. Right. Which is cool. Um, Oh, speaking of Portland, though, I'm going to be up there in two weeks. If you guys I are around, you should that. come. Yeah. 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 Like, I, I, are you going to be in Eugene on the 22nd, I thought? And then Portland. Yeah, Eugene on the 22nd, Hood River on the 23rd, and then Portland on the 24th and 25th. We're doing two nights at the 1905. So, yeah, oh, if you guys are around, you should tell oh, me. Oh, yeah. Totally love come come see you for sure. So excited. So right, right before we got on, I, I did see those dates and got super stoked. I was like, what are the chances? Like, that is so great. Yeah. That'll, that'll really complete it too because we got to meet Jen in person we got to you know meet James in person at the peach festival last year so we'll get to meet you too well we're gonna we're gonna see her at skull and roses too oh, yeah yeah but this is even sooner yeah, this is yeah. Cool. we don't have to wait that long that's true oh. um yeah, that'll be great yeah yeah so, awesome. so I have okay what's one of your favorite things about touring with Trey touring with Phil and touring for yourself Hmm. Oh, well, I think touring with Trey is just like, we, I know the band so well. It's like, I, I, my family got bigger when I joined the band. It's like all those fun times on the tour bus where we're just being goofy, <laughs> like yeah, just silly stuff. Like those little moments, I live for that. I mean, obviously the music on stage is really fulfilling and life affirming too but it's like when you know someone that well and you've been around for you know in that same environment for so long it's like it's like a family reunion and i love that and we don't get to do it all that often so it does feel precious like those everyone kind of crammed in the front lounge of the bus making food talking you know yeah. giggling i love that yeah and i think yeah the playing with Phil, what's really fun is getting to bring this different kind of color into this music that's so well established, you know, it's really cool every once in a while, you know, we'll be in some jam and we'll have made up some part that's kind of we come in really strong and you just see Phil's head turn and the smile that lights Aww. up his face is just priceless like that of, you know, having an impact and, and bringing something fresh that, you know, is obviously a being approved of by the goat, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. original. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, and then touring with my, I think, you know, just the kind of what we touched on touring with my project with Ian, it just feels like in a way, the most authentic representation of who I am. Like it's so stripped down. It's so gentle. It's like, I'm bearing my soul in a different way than is possible in these bigger venues with this yeah. louder, you know, a bigger band and a louder setup. So I just feel like it feels really soothing to me to be able to get that soft and that subtle and have this like really intimate connection with Ian and then have other people brought in along for it is I think really special. And, you know, those kind of shows where there's like this hush in the crowd or like you go for something and you can hear someone like sigh or like Aww. you know like just the the intimate nature of the shows makes makes it just feel very special to be sharing this music and you know it's you know in a different language but it kind of transcends that sometimes and people feel touched by it and that's like what i live to do with music is to, to make people feel good make people feel emotions period and um and yeah then the just the touring being able to tour with my best friend you know, and, and have it not feel like work most of the time is such a blessing. That's really heartwarming, Natalie, that I, I can feel your love for Ian, I can feel your love for your brothers and sisters, you know, in tab, I can feel your love and respect for, like, Phil, and I just want you to, like, think about something, you know, Phil's been doing this, basically his entire life, and so for him to have a new experience on stage, that's a huge, yeah. huge deal, you know? And the fact that the three mm -hmm. of you can come in as such a close-knit group and create newness in something that is 
needs it. You know, everyone loves those, that music and everyone is, you know, it's like personal to everyone, but to have fresh air underneath it, literally with all of you, like, that's what the horn section, it's air, it's bringing fresh air into that. And I just want to thank you for upping that, um, every experience that you're bringing, like you have such a freshness to you and, and hearing about your parents, you know, upbringing and all of that stuff. It just really helps to, um, give a better idea of, of who is bringing the music to us. And I'm just really grateful. And thank you so much for spending time with yeah. us and even more. So I'm excited to see you in a couple weeks in, in our neck of the woods to bring your softness and, and that like, the, I, like the type of music that you two are doing together is exactly my speed. Yep. I love that. I, I, it's something that like, I love flamenco music so much too. And oh, one yeah. of my best experiences is um, listening to going to a concert in a listening room and he, and not being able to applaud, but only being able to emote and hear. And that is something that I'm like, I love so much. So just thank you for your diversity and your craft and like the sweetness and the tenderness you put into everything and the love of learning. Cause it really transcends the music. It really does. And music's your tool, but like you're really putting yourself out there. And I just want to say thank you for doing that and all of it. And and also I have to say to thanks for hanging out with us. Cause you don't, yeah. you don't have to do this stuff, man. You know, you could, <laughs> could easily say no and pass and that, that i want you to know that it's appreciated and and oh. this, is, this is awesome well thank you guys for having me it's i mean i knew just based on the back and forth that it was going to be a great um <laughs> great chat but i appreciate everything you guys have said and for having me and looking forward to to meeting you in person yes. and, and <laughs> out there yeah yeah if if when we're at skull and roses if you want if you have a few minutes let's sit down and talk sure yeah okay. cool. Should, i'll be coming yeah i think i think we'll have that whole day there hopefully so okay cool we'll get we'll a chance to hang about out. it That'd all right great. all right yeah. enjoy the show yeah. tonight well yeah. thank you guys so much i will so Aww. great meeting you all be thank in a you, couple Dad. weeks take Bye. care Natalie. okay Sounds Bye. good. Bye. 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 Bye.